So um, I'm delighted to be here on the stage today with uh, two of our Hyperledger Foundation Governing Board members. We have Christine Moy, who is the Director of Global Head of Link at Onyx and responsible for all things blockchain, I think, at JP Morgan as well. And Joe Lubin, who is the founder of Consensus and co-founder of Ethereum as well. So we'll have a great conversation with them. Um, before we get started, um, since the topic is you know op blockchain in action, a lot of people do ask us, where um, blockchain is so far. So I want to just highlight a key, a couple key use cases that we're seeing in the marketplace um, around uh, CBDCs, securities and exchange, trade finance, and uh, our fun favorite NFT. So I'll give a little overview of that, and then we'll go and have the uh, Christine and Joe talk about what they are seeing. Uh, from a CBDC space, uh, Hyperledger is really leading the way across multiple projects in implementations. For example, the Eastern Caribbean uh, CBDC uh, retail CBDC project, Dcash, uh, is built and is in production with Hyperledger Fabric. Um, we have also the Bank of Bakan. Uh, so in Cambodia, um, in 2019, they launched a retail CBDC, um, and that uses Hyperledger Eroha, and they're already, you know, they claim to have 1.4 million transactions just in the first part of 2021. So that one is really a nice success story um, out of the Asia Pacific region. Um, we're also seeing just uh, recently, about two weeks ago, the Bank of Nigeria um, released their uh, central bank digital currency with Hyperledger Fabric. Um, so another use case, uh, the Banque de France uh, has also a wholesale CBDC with Hyperledger Fabric. Uh, the Bank of Thailand uh, and the uh, BI uh, have a pilot with this called Atheon Lion Rock. Maybe Joe can talk about that in a little bit. Um, and that is with Hyperledger Bezu. Uh, and I can go on and on. I can take the next 30 minutes talking about all the things that are in production in the CBD space, CBDC space. Um, in securities exchanges, for example, we have the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange. This is a peer-to-peer -peer lending in, uh, uh, to, for liquid market segmentation. And uh, BTP Duncan is here in the audience, maybe. Do I see Duncan? There he is, raising his hand. So if you want to talk about that, you can touch base with Duncan. Um, and that uses Hyperledger Sawtooth. Um, so, uh, and another one on, uh, there's Bondi Blocks, which is a fractional bond exchange, and that's one of the first in the marketplace uh, for fixed income securities. Um, so uh, in trade finance, uh, Hyperledger and the Hyperledger projects continue to be leaders in this space. Uh, TradeLens, uh, for example, now has over 300. This is the Maersk. Um, um, platform has over 300 organizations, um, and they have claimed to ship, have tracked 42 million containers uh, in close to 2.2 billion events um, on Hyperledger Fabric. The key to those stats um, is not that they're great stats, they are great stats, but the technology is in production across many of our projects. They're being used uh, for real blockchain use cases as well. Um, and then last but not least, um, NFT, since I, 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 I hear that you can't be in New York without saying the word NFTs as you walk down the street. Um, we've had NFT uh, use cases. Uh, Panini, for those of you who are soccer fans, they actually do uh, trading cards. Um, and that has been a, a, an NFT platform that's been live since uh, 2019 with Hyperledger Sawtooth. Um, and the, le the recent news with Palm NFT, which is a Hyperledger Bezu uh, um, project uh, with DC Comics and Space Jam and a couple others, um, and the Damien Hirst project, which is an art uh, project that's really interesting where they release 10,000 pieces of art both as NFTs and as physical pieces. And within a year, the experiment will be, will people keep the NFT digital version or want to have the full, you know, the actual physical art? And I'm really looking forward to seeing how that <laughs> works out. Um, but without further ado, it's not about me and our community is fantastic and we can talk about it. But Christine, um, as I said, is managing director of Global Head of Link um, and very responsible for blockchain uh, strategy for the firm. Um, I've heard you over over and over the years talking about how open source is so important to the work that you do. Um, so I was wondering if you can maybe share a little bit about uh, what JP Morgan's working on in the blockchain space and how you approach it. Sure, sure. So, uh, you know, for those of you who don't know, JP Morgan has been researching and doing development with blockchain for the past half a decade. Uh, some of the key things that we've done is drive blockchain to bank grade enterprise uh, enterprise use 
uh, to the point where, you know, five or six years ago, it was like something we were just trying to figure out. But then now we can say that we are transacting hundreds of billions of dollars, that's billions, not millions, hundreds of billions of dollars of value on blockchain, uh, on, on an open source variant of blockchain. Um, and tra uh, through our intraday repo and JP Morgan coin projects, and then also uh, have tens of millions of transactions flowing through our link network, which is our, our network of cross-border payments banks. Um, actually, it was our blockchain team that first brought JP Morgan to the open source community. Uh, the occasion of us forking public Ethereum and adding privacy and performance uh, and basically open sourcing Quorum was actually the first time in the history of the world, or at least the history of JP Morgan, that we invested a lot in something and then gave it away for free. Um, and we're actually quite proud because, you know, over the years, many other companies and banks have actually picked up Quorum and started building their solutions on it, um, unbeknownst to us. And they didn't have to ask us about it, didn't have to pay us for it. And the reason why, um, you know, we were very strongly committed to the open to building on open source is because we actually think open source code um, and community just results in better, stronger software, right? Essentially, you have open source code that's uh, being tested in the wild. Uh, it has the eyes of the community um, constantly um, being innovated on. Um, and then innovation itself is more rapid because you basically have this compounding of people building upon their each other's uh, work as opposed to you know one software stack that's sort of held behind closed doors and only one team's working on something. So you know uh, you know we've been very committed to open source uh, and you know since the blockchain team specifically open source quorum that has opened the door for the rest of the firm at JP Morgan to contribute to and participate in open source projects outside of blockchain. Um, we are a proud founding member of Hyperledger and also additionally other standards bodies like Enterprise Ethereum Alliance and uh, continue to engage. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's basically our take on open source. We would prefer to build an open source than to build on vendor driven or closed loop systems. Excellent. So, you know, there was a recent, um, a survey, the De Deloitte uh, survey, and it's, you know, they surveyed about 1,200 senior executives and 81% of them said that blockchain tech is broadly scalable and achieving mainstream adoption. Um, Joe, you know, if you could introduce yourself and consensus and uh, some of the work that you've done, but you've been a powerful advocate for decentralized technologies, which, you know, at its core is about open source as well. So um, share with us some of your what you've seen in, in the industry here. Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, so our company consensus has been um, very prominent since the start of the Ethereum ecosystem. I, I can attest that JP Morgan was there. Uh, right from the start uh, before uh, public mainnet was, was even launched. Um, uh, we've done a lot of work um, uh, along with many others in the ecosystem to, to bring about a new um, information technology infrastructure, um, a decentralized protocol infrastructure. Um, and we think of it as a, as a potential new trust foundation for the planet, uh, moving us from millennia of subjective trust systems uh, to automated and objective trust systems. Um, this new trust foundation has enabled decentralized finance, global decentralized finance, where lots of different uh, financial primitives, financial protocols are, are interoperating with one another um, and essentially build, uh, bringing democratization uh, to the global finance layer. Um, enabling software developers, technologists, and entrepreneurs uh, to build it rather than see it built behind closed doors. Um, and also bringing the same sort of democratization uh, to the governance layer of the planet uh, uh, with the new Trust Foundation. Uh, we saw what bringing democratization did for access to information and publishing of information with the, the advent of the internet and web technologies. And, and I'm excited that those, those new foundational layers are uh, getting increasingly democratized. Um, our company consensus essentially operates a flywheel. Uh, so we, um, we have um, Ethereum node 
technology, uh, Hyperledger Basu. Uh, we build Ethereum 1 and Ethereum 2 um, clients, and we're um, driving the merge of Ethereum 1 uh, and Ethereum 2, basically moving public mainnet Ethereum uh, to from a proof-of-work system, which is enormously consumptive of energy, to a, a proof-of-stake system, which uses very little energy. Um, and we have a major infrastructure elements. So we, we have a bunch of projects that are about developer enablement. Um, they're the base of the flywheel. And we have the, um, the major user interface um, to what we think of as a global open, open source decentralized super app. Uh, and the, these are applications that are getting built on top of decentralized protocols like Ethereum uh, and like many other um, protocols that are all bridging to one another uh, in our ecosystem. Uh, so our, our flywheel is operational. Uh, we have uh, MetaMask as the user interface for consumers, and we have MetaMask Institutional um, that's bringing aboard uh, um, many kinds of institutions. Um, in terms of the usage of open source in our ecosystem, um, I don't have to um, list uh, the value of open source to you, but uh, I think it's interesting to point out that uh, our ecosystem, the public mainnet ecosystem, um, does some pretty radical things um, with respect to openness. Um, early on in the Ethereum project, we felt that, um, hey, it's really great that all this is open source and that anybody can come along and fork the project, um, either fork the code base or fork a running protocol. Um, and um, that basically, uh, we believed back then, uh, would force us to, to be more honest, um, to be intellectually honest in, in how we speak about things, uh, but also to think about how different opinions, different agendas uh, could be brought together into the same project. And if they couldn't, um, then forking is a, a tremendous capability that, that uh, that we regularly use in our ecosystem. We see projects uh, forking other projects. Um, um, you do your project here and we'll take all of your code and, and we'll uh, move it into our own system. We might modify things a little bit or, or we might not, um, might be just better marketing. Um, and we even see crazy things like stealing content and community from one project and moving it over into another. Uh, there's this thing uh, called vampire attacks, where um, one project can incentivize a whole community to move over um, to um, to another project. Um, that may sound overly adversarial, but I, I look forward to a world where uh, we don't um, rely on um, licenses and patents, uh, etc., in, in order to protect our work. But we're just all moving so fast and innovating so fast that. Uh, um, that uh, speed uh, will win the day and we'll, we'll start up projects and they will um, offer solutions and, um, and hopefully someone will come along pretty quickly and, and build something better. It's building those communities and places for those communities to grow as well and mature as well. So, um, you know, one of the things, and certainly in financial services and banking, is people are always like, you know, there's efficiency gains. You know, I think we're six, eight years in, in many of these use cases where people have seen efficiency gains. Um, but what about new revenue models? I know there was a recent report that JP Morgan put out with. Uh, uh, Oliver Wyman that said, you know, that, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, new revenue uh, programs that can be instituted. So, Christine, if you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. And by the way, I would highly recommend that everyone go and Google and pick up this report that our team published with Oliver Wyman about CBDCs and the work that we've been doing in the past half a decade with central banks and talking about how we think about the next generation of global uh, multi-currency payments rails. Uh, and we actually have like a really cool chart talking about the different roles. I'm not gonna read it to you right now. Um, can't have, didn't have time to memorize it. Um, but that is one example as it relates to uh, payments specifically in global multi-currency CBDC based payments of uh, you know how a new domain and new roles and responsibilities and therefore revenue streams get created. Um, other examples include Link, which I mentioned is our network of cross-border payments banks uh, connected together to exchange information. 
Um, and basically, it's focused on solving cross-border payments problems without actually doing the value transfer, just doing information transfer uh, specifically to address sanctions exceptions that happen in the cross-border payments process or to enable account validation before making payment to prevent lost, investigated, or fraudulent payments or like fraudulently placed payments. And um, what's really interesting about what we've built with Link is that essentially it's turning out to be a global data marketplace, but one in which JP Morgan nor anyone on the network can actually see or store anyone else's data. And this is specific to our, impl our implementation of Quorum. Um, but you know what it opens up is the ability to uh, enable banks that are on the network who are responding, answering the question like, hey, is account one, two, three, Christine Moy's account, yes or no? Um, the bank on the responding side to respond, yes, it is Christine Moy's account, you can definitely have confidence making payment, for them to actually get paid directly for the data that they have. Um, they don't have to contribute that data into any honeypot, they don't lose control of that data, and in fact, they get paid. So creating a new revenue stream for banks to share information that they're probably already sharing anyway to fix some of these payments issues that happen when you know they're already in process, as one example. Um, the other example is Intraday Repo, which is on our Onyx digital assets platform that is built on Consensus Quorum. And um, this, is, this is the platform for which we're transacting hundreds of billions of dollars a day by this point, having gone live um, like less than a year ago. And um, this was you know, less about cost savings, but, and even not even about generating revenue, but more about creating a new tool in the toolkit to manage intraday liquidity be uh, between banks and broker dealers. Um, not going to get into the mechanics, but a repo is kind of like a secured loan. I lend you $100, you give me $100 of securities collateral, we agree to return the legs. Typically, that's counted in days. So pay me back tomorrow on an overnight basis or on a term basis, pay me back in seven days. And now, using blockchain subledgers that live atop of JP Morgan's demand deposit system systems and Bank of New York Mellon's uh, tri-party collateral systems, we can actually do repo trades that are counted in hours, if not minutes. Right, so um, you know that's about creating new experiences, new products, new tradable products that inherently create new revenue streams. Yep. And Joe, you know, certainly about creating new revenue streams and new markets. What what, what can you add there? Um, so there are lots. There's certainly lots of uh, opportunities for creating new revenue streams. Uh, we do that, and, and many others in our ecosystem are doing that. But. Uh, um, the exciting thing to think about is um, essentially the, the profound paradigm shift that, that we're undergoing. Um, we're seeing um, several related disruptive technologies crossing the chasm together into mainstream adoption. Um, so it's blockchain, it's cryptocurrencies, it's decentralized finance, it's NFTs. Um, and the opportunity here, especially NFTs and the the things that uh, NFTs are doing um, to um, the artistic content creator and owner community is, is really remarkable. It's uh, a lot of people um, discovering the technology and finding uh, real value in it and creating real value. Um, but the thing to notice is that as uh, AI and automation um, starts to take um, take over the necessities of life, um, starts to um, efficiently um, feed us and clothe us and shelter us. Uh, we're increasingly, uh, especially with the, uh, the COVID interregnum and, and the increased digitization of our society, uh, we're increasingly freed uh, to worry less about moving atoms um, just in time to where they're needed. Um, and even advertising um, uh, to um, sort of create uh, more need or artificial need so that we move atoms uh, uh, even more. Uh, the business model of the internet was uh, essentially ported over from the business model of, uh, of the traditional community and, and we set up uh, malls on the internet and advertising uh, to drive the physical economy. But we're um, soon to be um, released from that to a certain degree. Soon it will take care of itself, especially with 
uh, autonomy in software systems, which we're seeing uh, in blockchain technology. And, and so we're soon to be freed um, to pursuing uh, to pursue creativity and education and gamification of everything. So, uh, yes, uh, when a new technology comes along, uh, you think about ways to adapt the old ways of doing business, like doing a radio play uh, in front of a television camera. Um, but the exciting opportunities um, are um, decentralized organizations and, uh, and all the different ways that we can move from the age of silos to the age of community and collaboration. Yeah. I don't know if you catched one of the, the one of the keynotes and Nadine uh, Sakar from uh, State Street was talking about the, the that this is enterprise software when we're talking about banking and financial systems. This is stuff that's going to take a long time. There's regulatory requirements. You know, anyone who's been in the enterprise software business knows that the cycle from sales to implementation to deployment to you know getting that PR out the door saying that it's done is a long cycle. Although we're certainly seeing that shorter and shorter. Um, you know, one of the things, Christine, you talked about um, permissioned, you know, a, you know, quorum as a permissioned network. Um, Hyperledger, you know, the foundation itself has over the last six years really expanded in the continuum of what types of projects that we offer, primarily because of what the market demand is and where we see uh, and where our community sees the market demand for permissioned versus public um, networks and blockchain. So I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about that and... Uh, um, yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, for, for our part, um, we have a strong conviction in public blockchain and public networks. Um, we always have, even when it wasn't cool. Uh, and it wasn't cool just a few years ago, right? A few years ago. Pretty cool to some of us. I mean, I, I, we, like, thank you, thank you. You thought it was cool, but everybody else who was like an enterprise in banking it was like, why, why, like, what are you doing? Um, and for our part, We've always had this conviction about public blockchain and public networks. Uh, however, we realize as a globally regulated bank, we have to walk people through doors, right? You can't go from like zero, like super centralized software to open, decentralized, democratized like markets in the way that Joe has described. <laughs> and so the way that our program has walked people through doors is to say, you know, to start with permission blockchain, to say like, hey, this is enterprise software, it's permissioned, we've got traditional firewalling and white, IP whitelisting, everything that you understand. Now let's just solve some real business problems like in a format that everybody is familiar and comfortable with and that doesn't scare everyone. And that's actually the reason why one of our first use cases is let's resolve sanctions exceptions. Like literally, like can we find the most like boring use case that does not open up any risk and like doesn't terrorize everyone who like, you know, has to like approve this at the bank and is already feeling like completely nervous about the fact that there's blockchain in the name of whatever the thing is that we're trying to approve, right? Um, and slowly over time, we've shifted the Overton window to not only exchange information, doing super safe things like resolving sanctions ex exceptions to like, let's do value transfer to like, as I mentioned, now let's do hundreds of billions of value transfer on a, on a, on a blockchain. And it's probably about the time, um, and you know, our teams are working together on this, it's probably about the time for public blockchains and permission blockchains to converge. Uh, and you know, for those of you who work uh, at a large enterprise, you know that there still exists like an intranet, like a company intranet that you know you use the same web browser to like you know log into your company intranet and do your you know internal directory things, and then you use the same browser to go to the public intranet. And that is kind of what we see to be perhaps the future world, maybe not the future future where everything's public, but at least the near term future where public networks and permission networks mesh together. And in fact, a lot of the technology that is required to connect these networks is already in rapid innovation and development. In crypto land, it's just called layer two, as an example, right? So like, imagine a world where, you know, our bank created um, and governed permission networks with proper KYC and AML and all the things that are enterprise grade become a layer two to mainnet as an example, just as an example, just putting it out there. Um, and so that's that's the reason why, again, we care very much about open source, uh, open source technology and staying involved and you know, being a contributor and being a part of that community because otherwise we'd be connecting just to ourselves and that's no fun and also not commercial.
And, and, and you must be wondering, like, from a bank, bank's perspective, like, what are we doing? If, you know, Joe's talking about the democratization of finance and money networks, like, what is a bank who typically holds the cards in that domain doing by accelerating that? Um, you know, but the fact of the matter is, is that we don't want to be Kodak, right? We're not going to, like, close our eyes to the fact that technology has enabled change. And as we have learned with all technology, if it's possible, it will happen. We don't know the time scale, but it will happen. So, you know, it's my job and my team's job to make sure that we lead JP Morgan into the next generation of network technology. Uh, and we, you know, maintain our leadership, even if that means we have to change our stripes. Yeah. You know, if you would have told me four years ago that we would be on the stage with both of you having this conversation, and when I joined Hyperledger, I would, most of us would be like, no, it won't move that fast. It won't go that <laughs> So um, thank you. Joe, what do you think about that? You're, you're, you're on the other side, but you're getting We're on the same brought point. in as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, Blockchain we're, brand. We're both pretty close to the center in a, in a mm. sense. Um, so consensus has held what we call the convergence thesis uh, since we started and, and that uh, is that uh, the revolutionaries would get out there and, and pioneer um, decentralized protocols in the most difficult of contexts in, in the Byzantine environment um, and make that work um, but the consensus uh, would work with and has worked with uh, um, hundreds of enterprises um, since the start uh, to meet them where they're comfortable. Uh, so we build a lot of the infrastructure for, for the public mainnet uh, ecosystem, and we've hardened a lot of that technology, um, and we've made um, the, the developer lifecycle um, much more enjoyable. Um, but we've also we've built consortia, we, we do work with JPM and other major organizations, um, and uh, we recognize that uh, um, having some decentralization is incredibly valuable. Um, having private permission systems built on the most robust decentralized protocol technology, Ethereum, uh, just makes sense. Uh, the, the information technology infrastructure of the future will be a very large number of interoperating decentralized protocols that subserve different functions. Um, so, so there's a trust layer, there's execution, there's data availability, there's guaranteed data avail availability, there's um, heavy compute uh, bandwidth, et cetera. Um, and um, we are moving towards that and we've built uh, a decent amount of that. Um, we have a project that's that's based on, on Hyperledger Besu um, that in fact we jointly uh, built together. Um, uh, it's called Consensus Quorum. It started uh, uh, inside of JP Morgan, um, and it basically took the Ethereum core technology and it, it created uh, a layer of confidentiality and, and enterprise friendliness uh, around that. And so uh, we currently offer that to enterprises um, on Azure uh, and moving to other clouds at some point soon. Uh, and um, effectively, Microsoft um, handed over the base layer of their blockchain practice uh, to us to operate uh, uh, Quorum Blockchain Service, a managed service. Um, so um, it makes it uh, easy for the convergence thesis uh, to play out. And um, with decentralized finance gaining so much liquidity, um, so many innovative ways for organizations to construct their own financial instruments or, or uh, configure their own financial flows without, sorry, the need for intermediaries. Um, uh, and with NFTs getting um, enormously popular, um, uh, this Quorum blockchain service uh, enables uh, enterprises to stand up their own infrastructure, uh, their own private permission subnet, uh, intranet, uh, and, and connected via bridges uh, to mainnet if they so desire. So there's a strong and growing commercial ecosystem supporting these systems. There's real production use cases out there moving real assets, billions and billions of dollars in assets using this technology. Um, there are uh, groups working on interoperability, right, to be able to interoperate these networks. It's not a network to rule them all. Um, what are, you know, what do you think is the biggest challenge as we close off um, very quickly? Um, to us, you know, being here next year and having even bigger stories to tell. 
for my part, I think the biggest challenges now are talent, uh, finding finding the right talent uh, to be working in these open source communities. And by the way, operating in open source communities is a little bit different than also just building closed software. There's a lot of community engagement. There's, um, you know, when we did Quorum, like we had a Slack channel and we had to like, we had to manage the GitHub and all the things. So like, you know, um, you know, definitely developers that are, uh, have experience uh, with open source. And then separately, I think a lot of what we try to juggle is managing our priorities, right? Like we have a roadmap of what we think we want to do, what that we think is important, but because change is happening so rapidly right now, um, many opportunities are being opened up and then, you know, kind of get into this whole like shiny object thing where like, wait, there's an opportunity there. Should we do that? Do that. And then, you know, resources are limited. Talent is tight. So, um, you know, th those are challenges I see. Yeah, so the growth and demand um, in our ecosystem is off the charts, uh, whether it's um, technologists, entrepreneurs, um, finance professionals moving into the decentralized protocol, the, the public mainnet ecosystem, um, or whether it's users uh, just, just using um, cryptocurrencies or, or NFTs. Um, we, there, there's a wicked war for talent out there. We need to, uh, uh, to service uh, users uh, um, with greater functionality. Um, and it's about usability too. It's, it's still a, a somewhat immature technology and we've got a lot of learning to do uh, from um, great technologists in, in the Web2 ecosystem that are uh, moving into our ecosystem in droves. Um, and we still only have 24 hours a day, which is uh, the biggest problem. You're not going to solve that for us, Joe? <laughs> Excellent. Well, with Christine and Joe, you know, helping and leading the way here in the Hyperledger Foundation community as well, um, I think we'll, we'll, make it, we'll make it there. So thank you, Christine. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, everybody, for thank joining you. us today. Thanks, everybody. Thank We're hiring. <laughs>